Good evening, everybody. This is Cinnamon Noir. And this is the Ramen Shaman. Welcome back to Carol Blaster. Now, we finished the game last time, but today we are going to take a whack at hard mode, which is called Zangyo, Ooh. which you might be aware is Japanese for overtime. Both appropriate in the context of the game and for the theme of this section, as we'll soon see. Look at that pile of binders. They should have, like, an extra... What's the Japanese word for, um, death from overwork? Karoshi. <laughs> that have an extra hard for... mode? Oh, uh, why have there never been a mode in a game called Karoshi? That'd be funny. So, uh, we're actually planning a company trip. I think this may take place immediately after the first playthrough. Or maybe earlier. Either way, you may notice our character's skin is different. It's blue mm. instead of green. So yeah, the irony. We have to work overtime in order to get to our company-sponsored trip. So the girls are actually going on ahead. Uh, this little office worker and then the boss. The cat boss. So this is just a hard mode. It is the pretty much the same levels as before, but as you'll soon see, they have really a different layout, different enemies. I mean, frankly, they are kind of different levels. The and bosses different... are the same, but they have new moves, you know. And kind of a different plot line, right? That's right. The plot line I mean... is actually completely different. So yeah, after we leave, he answers the phone and a guy is talking about a work-producing machine. And then work materializes out of thin air. Very mysterious. Oh, Jesus. We'll be getting to that soon. Anyway. So you may have already noticed right off the bat, there are harder enemies here and requiring some jumps like right off the bat. Mm -hmm. There were no bottomless pits in the first part of the game. Uh, when we first started this game. That wasn't until near the end of the first level. Here, they're throwing them in right away. So, because this is a new playthrough, I'm now on the weakest gun again, and I only have two hit points. I actually recently tried a couple of run-throughs of the regular game with some limitations, which was very interesting. In one, I tried not to upgrade my weapons at all, which worked oh, until about the middle of World 6 when I was forced to change. Uh, and then the other one, I tried to only have two hearts, which worked until the final boss. Unfortunately, I did not actually finish a full playthrough with either of those limitations. But I invite anyone who has this game to, it's a very interesting concept. It does completely change the game. I figured out some new things about it. One thing I figured out is that the Star Mine, the fully uh -huh. upgraded version of the bubble, is actually way better than I thought. It's the best weapon in the game for some of the bosses, including the final boss, and the boss of this uh, next to last level. And also, it's just really good for clearing out a room full of enemies, because all the little mines stick around on screen. So you can trap an enemy and hit them with, like, all the bombs at once. Mm. That's good for certain types of enemies. So it, it allows for some, like, more clever tactics. That's right. It's a totally different way of playing from using my standbys, which are the laser and the uh, ninja one. And then, of course, the flame also had some uses that I was not aware of, which I'll mention when we get to the relevant part in the hard mode. Still. I love that you're doing self-imposed challenges for this. <laughs> it's something I normally don't do, but I've gotten so comfortable with this game that I just figured, you know, make it more interesting for myself. To be perfectly yeah. frank, playing through a normal run playthrough of this game without limitations anymore is just too easy. Fair enough. That's what happens when you play a game for a long time. You know, par part of this is because we just finished a Dark Souls 2 run, and I still have that on the brain. Hmm. Um, but... I was gonna say, it's interesting that of all the Dark Soul, of all the Souls-like games, mm -hmm. only one has had um, self-imposed challenges are built into the game functionality. Well, technically, that means they're not self-imposed. You know what I mean? Well, like you mean the game is conscious of them. special special challenge modes like literally built into the game. Yeah, yeah, sure. And that's, um, Salt and Sanctuary. Right. Though, Dark Souls 2 actually had a covenant, um, what it literally did, it literally did nothing but, um, dramatically increase enemy damage yeah. and prevent enemies from despawning after you killed them X number of times. So in addition to everything else here, um, things are also more expensive in the shop. You may have noticed that instead of being 1,500 for an extra life, it is now 2,250 coins. Interesting. Which is more than I have ever collected <laughs> in any playthrough of this game. I mean, not total, but at any given time. 
Um, it's, it's funny that the buying an extra life option is even there, because it really is never actually an option. <laughs> it's never as sensible a move as buying the next upgrade for a gun you have, and when you're done buying all the guns, you're probably almost done with the game, so you don't really have, you know, the occasion to buy the extra life. It's funny. And I assume, like everything else, it goes up in price after you buy one, so I can only imagine what happens after you buy the first one up. Anyway, I buy a heart boost here in addition to the repeater. Uh, I did try just before doing this, actually. I mean, just before right now. Uh -huh. um, playing through this first level of hard mode while not upgrading the repeater. Uh, I don't recommend it. It's extremely <laughs> punishing. This section in particular will kill you many times, because these guys are very hard without the longer range of the repeater. And then the boss, nearly impossible. I didn't even manage to get to the second phase of the boss in this first level when I had the regular gun. It, it's amazing what a difference it makes just making this one upgrade from the pea shooter to the repeater. For one thing, the bullets travel about twice as far on the screen, and for the other, they do twice as much damage. I mean, really, when you think about it, it's a huge increase. Probably more than any other gun upgrade in the whole game. I did try. I tried getting all the way through, and it just, oof, it was punishing. Yeah. I'm not- while I am the kind of guy to appreciate self-imposed challenges occasionally, I'm not the kind who enjoys punishment. No. Um, so that's why I gave up on the limitations eventually. I did make a bargain with myself on the, like, no upgrading weapons run, which is I allowed myself to upgrade the two weapons I didn't normally use, while not allowing myself to upgrade the laser and the, uh, the multi-shot. And that actually made the game a lot more interesting. Like a good challenge, yeah. It helps you understand the functionality of the different weapons, you know? When you go through a normal playthrough of this game, if you're like me, you don't get to learn how to use the bubbles at all. I mean, I mentioned in the last uh, episode, I think, that the bubble has such limited utility in ordinary circumstances. But as it turns out, it actually gets much better when you upgrade it. I stand by my statement that the original bubble is not a good idea to use at all. Hmm. You pretty much have to upgrade it. It's kind of like, you know, in Pokemon, like Hopip. You know, Hopip evolves into something that might become useful, but it itself just absolutely sucks. Even, um, Skip Loom and Jump Club aren't great. Yeah, they are. I Maybe I owe an apology to the, uh, to the, uh, to that weapon. Anyway. It's, I think Abra is the best example of something that starts off kind of useless, but becomes yeah. much better. Yeah, you're right. A lot of people say Magikarp to Gyarados, but really, I mean, trying to evolve Magikarp is a thankless task. Mm -hmm. And also, the thing about Gyarados is, for a reward for leveling up, like, a really crappy Pokémon and spending lots of time on it, it's not one of the best Pokémon in the game. It, it really is Which it isn't. should be. That double weakness to Electric in the first generation was terrible. Yeah, also the fact that in the first... Gyarados had, um... Most more attack than special attack. Yeah, which is but a bad the problem idea. is all of its attacks were like water moves. Right. And, and, well, and its types were water flying, and it didn't get any flying moves. Yep. Anyway, you'll see here the uh, hard mode version of the first boss, rather different. For one thing, it shoots out these things instead of just like shooting out and then going away. They bounce around and persist, mm -hmm. which makes them a lot harder. That's the hardest change of this boss, I think. It's also a little more resilient. But that's not much of a big deal. Also, it shoots out a lot more of these things in the second phase. Yeah, I was gonna say that. that this really like, is crazy. That was. So you can see I've already lost. Easy. I've already lost two of my three hearts, but I managed to pull this out. I don't think I have yet, uh, playing through hard mode, beaten this boss with any more than one heart. It always cuts me down to the quick. Mm. But anyway, we make it through and get the fan. Yep. And that's what matters. And instead of destroying the Negativus Legatia in this playthrough, we destroy piles of work. <laughs> which are blocking our way back to the office. Pretty much in general, those things have been replaced by these piles of work, which is interesting. Oh. Is that one here? That's odd. So yeah, the cat guy's outside. Talking to a salesman. <laughs> and he's got this big machine next to him. And they don't say anything, which is kind of odd. He looks rather nonplussed, but maybe that's just the way, you know, his face is designed. Yeah. It's, he kind of has the perfect poker face. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the thing he was trying to sell us is a work-producing machine. 
which literally just generates work to do. God. Mm-hmm. So, on to the next level. The greenery zone. If anything, I would actually say, compared with the first level, this one is a little bit easier. Compared with, I guess what I'm saying is, it's less harder than the original version, than the first level was. <laughs> Technically, it's not easier than the first level, but in the original game, it was a big jump up in difficulty going from the first level to this, and the jump here is not nearly as much. We do, however, have some bottomless pits where there were none before. It's kind of funny, you get the feeling like this was a lake before, because you see the log and everything. But if it was a lake, then there would be solid ground somewhere below here. But instead, it's just a bottomless pit. Yeah, I feel like they could have done something a bit more thematically appropriate. Hmm, I don't know, I kind of liked it. <laughs> bottomless pits where there weren't any before can feel kind of ominous, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's what they were going for. Or I should say he. This game was mostly programmed by one guy. So yeah, mostly the same thing. You can take out some snails, take out fish. Not a lot has changed so far. One thing that has changed is we're going to see a lot more of these birds. Both yes. in the rooms where they originally were, and there's going to be them in places where they never were in the first one. I was going to ask about those birds. Mm-hmm. Those birds are very annoying, and uh, when I played through this game the first couple of times, they were very difficult for me to get a hang, to get a grip mm. on. Um, one thing about them is they will keep respawning if you don't destroy them. So if you, like, if one flies past you and you think you're safe, then you might be tempted to just jump where it was. And that's a very bad idea. Anyway, there's a little secret chest right here. So yeah, like, there's one right here, which you can definitely get up in your grill. Yeah, I can imagine. I barely managed to get rid of that one before it hit me in the face. The fan is pretty useful against these guys, but with the repeater, like since we have an upgraded original gun, it's kind of a wash right now which one is better. Mm -hmm. The fan is a wider spread, which can be more helpful, because these guys cover a lot of screen real estate. The fan also seems to do more damage. It does exactly as much damage as the repeater, oh. actually, and since it has a slower rate of fire, technically it does less if you can hit something. Uh. The thing is, though, since it has a wider sweep... Oh, here's an illustration of what I just said, by the way. Since we missed that guy the first time, he came back around. Mm -hmm. Anyway, since the fan has a wider sweep, it catches enemies more yeah. often, and that can lead to the misconception that it does more damage. I was getting a little bold there. I jumped right into it. Some very close calls. In general, I would say that there are a lot more close calls in hard mode. Mm. Which is how you'd expect it to be, but the game seems... Less focused on, like, strict numerical changes, and more on creating tough situations. Ah. Like, enemies don't have crap tons more health. It's just that they have moves that are more likely to put you in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. Which is the way I prefer hard modes to be, to be honest. I'm not a big fan of strict numerical, you know, supremacy. One thing that's new in this room, in addition yeah. to a lot more flies, is uh, these poison bubbles that are popping out of the ground. If you hit them, they will hurt you. I actually agree with you on the numerical supremacy thing. Yeah. Anyway, an interesting thing. We didn't see these blocks here the first time. These flies originally would just chase us, but when they hit a block, they bounce off of it. Interesting. That's a mechanic that they technically always have, always had, but you didn't get to see it in the first game. Because there were no blocks. There was nothing for them to bounce off of. So, we're gonna upgrade the fan to the wide shot. Which is definitely a good move for the upcoming boss. But unfortunately, that leaves us with not enough to uh, upgrade hearts. <laughs> do I do some farming? I worry that I might be doing some farming here. I shouldn't. I mean, we really don't have that. We're pretty far away from what we need to get that health up today. Gee, it would take up a lot of time here, we'll never get to the clouds. Which are one of the more interesting enemies in terms of the way they've been upgraded in this level. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll see that pretty soon. Oh. Bounce, bounce. Yeah, jumps are a little tougher in this version. There's a bottomless pit there where there wasn't one before. In the original mode, uh, you just had to jump from the top in order to get uh, past a difficult platform. Like, it was too high to ah. jump on from the floor. Ah, and here's another room with more birds, only in this case, the areas we have to stand on are a lot smaller. Yeah, the jumps are looking closer and closer to pixel perfect. 
Oh, just you wait. We're gonna see some really nasty ones in just a few levels. Because I'm sure you remember, we got a jetpack after level 3 in the original game. That is also true in this one, and once they give you the jetpack, they can give you absolutely huge jumps to go over. You do eventually get in this game to jumps that I would describe as pretty close to pixel perfect. I don't think it ever goes all the way to, like, you literally have to do a perfect run. Oh, good, we've gotten to the clouds. So, unlike the original game, where they would just float across the screen, screen kind of lazily, in this yeah. one, if you if they manage to reach the other side of the screen, they will turn ugly, and they will start chasing you directly. Interesting. So it gives you an incentive to try to clear them out before they get there, or to make sure you have the right weapons to clear them out very quickly. As you see here, I uh, didn't really manage to do much preemptive elimination, so I had to get rid of them on short notice. There are very few enemies in this game that don't have any changes to them. Interestingly enough, that little mud guy, the mud cyclops, is one of the few that hasn't changed at all. He has the same moves, same behavior. Although, funnily enough, the boss fight which features them here, now instead of being brown, they're green, which is a little bit odd. They weren't green in the level, but they're green now. Maybe they're actually different characters, I don't know. They always seemed like the same ones in the original version. I don't know if you remember this boss fight from the regular playthrough, but in this one, a lot more of them chase you, and in patterns that are a lot harder to predict, you see here I get hit, uh, they really just swamp you. The one where like five of them jump out at the same time, it's very difficult to avoid. This guy isn't much changed, he, you know, he chases you, he's the real boss, but you know, you do a lot of it before finding him. One thing that has changed is once you get him below a certain level, not only will more of the little guys be chasing behind him, but they also yeah. jump out in various places around him, and those uh, pie pans start falling from the ceiling. I was gonna this ask... turns into a complete clusterfuck eventually, and you I just basically gonna... have to wail on him and hope that you damage him. Was... Yeah, I was going to say I didn't remember those in the original. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's new. Right, we get the bubble. The worst weapon in the game that becomes the best mm -hmm. one. The magic harp of this let's play, if you will. I didn't appreciate it until... Well, honestly, I didn't even appreciate it while I was playing this, what you're seeing right now. It was only a couple days ago. But yeah, instead of having the guy jump out in this one, now we have this little nice little trap. And we get an actual reward if we manage to get past it. I preferred the original one, where the guy jumped out, also because the soundtrack just stops when he does that, and that's fun. Anyway, another level done. Hey. Finish it off with a bubble. We've got one more for this video, but you can probably see from the length of it that it's a doozy. It's gonna be the same length as the yeah. previous two. I was gonna say, the video's only half over. Yep. So the secretary and the cat boss are ready to go on their nice work vacation. There we go. And, uh... Oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot. She has a little spiel about overtime. No matter what area you're in, overtime is a constant. <laughs> and that reminds the boss of a time back when she was just an office drone. I like to think this is back in the 80s. You know, working at a company under someone else. And this company has the opposite problem as what we're having right now. Instead of not having enough work to do, they're practically going out of business. So the boss just says, uh, go home, everybody. There's no work to do. I've mentioned this before, but this is even tougher in Japan, where there's a deep-seated tradition of not firing people and mm. like, trying to keep everyone on, even if you're going through a really tough time, like a recession. Mm. Actually, now that I think about it, with a recession, this could easily be the late 90s, when there was a real-life huge recession yeah. all across East Asia. That would make more sense for the boss. Her being in her mid-40s in the present day makes more sense than being in her late 50s. Mm. She looks pretty young, actually, but I, I think because she has a flashback to a time when things at work were completely different, she must not be that young. Mm. Anyway, here we are back in the Ox Ox Hotel. Uh, similar to what we had last time, but the layout's very different, and one really big difference is we now have these little shocking guys traveling along the walls. They're kind oh. of like uh, the Potaboos from Super Mario. They will be appearing in numerous other levels soon. Here's a new enemy for hard mode, uh, these little spiders. They're really not that difficult. They're sort of replacing the bats who were here before. 
Oh. Though we will see bats. It's just there are fewer of them. For some reason, I, and I don't even, I'm not even sure these, they're comparable enemies, but I thought of the Wallmaster from Zelda. Wallmasters have a vague resemblance to spiders. I think that has more to do with it than any similarity in game style, the way huh. these guys move. Am I wrong? I mean, they that don't do right. anything like Wallmasters, if that's what you're thinking. They really are just enemies. In fact, they're probably one of the easier enemies in hard mode. They're one of the few that instead of being a variation on an existing enemy is a totally new one. Ah. But they don't do much. Their behavior is almost exactly the same as the bats. And to they don't take much damage either. To be fair, I don't actually know very much of that. I... Any of Zelda? the early Zelda games. Oh, well, I'm a huge Zelda fan, so... <laughs> oh, gee, that was embarrassing. All those tough jumps in level 2, and this is where I lose my life. Yeah. This is the first life I've lost in this playthrough. God, how embarrassing. Anyway, you need to get rid of that thing. You need to make sure you're taking very careful jumps here so that you get the things to <laughs> fall, but don't uh, get hit by them. And here, this is tough. It's hard to get uh, close enough to this guy to hit him while still staying far enough away that you can dodge those books. And I was going to say, you know about Wallmasters that if they fell down upon you from the ceiling, that they would transport you out of the dungeon, right? And you'd have to go all the way back? I didn't know that, Oh, that's no. the thing that made them so hellish in Zelda, and that's the reason why they have such a negative reputation. It's for that uh, exact reason, nothing else. Yeah, and that And that has been sound. the case ever since the original Legend of Zelda. They've had that ability to teleport you out of the room. That does sound pretty bad. Oh, it's it just actually, freaking annoying. It reminds me of an enemy in Bloodborne that, like, abducts you. Mm -hmm. But that actually takes you to a special area. It takes you to your heart goal, right? What? It takes you to your heart goal, the Unseen Village? Yeah, I think so. See, so my that's... relationship to Bloodborne is the same as yours to Zelda. I know a fair amount about it, even though I've never played it. Uh, well, I don't have a PS4, so... All right. But you did have a GameCube, right? Yes, I did. So there's really no excuse for you. you should have played Zelda. As you should know, since you've, like, used it. Oh, I know. I saw you play through, uh, Fire Emblem. Whatever it was called. Path oh, of Radiance. Path of Radiance, yeah. That was a great game. It's too bad we can't do a Let's Play of it. Because the script was hilarious. I mean... I mean, I'm not saying emulate it, but I am kind of saying, you know, emulate it. Yeah, I, that's, I, I'm actually, like, I'm actually thinking of that now. Mm, anyway, so here's a variation on the fish enemy we've seen a lot. These are, like, helicopter fish. They fly out of the water, and then they start their rotor and start, like, flying toward you. Hmm. I guess flying fish is better. So here's the mid-boss from this level. You might remember this is the first time we see a mid-boss in either game. The big variation here is that instead of just summoning the little uh, tumbleweeds when he flies down, he will also now summon two moles, who will pester you with more rocks. This screen can get really full of stuff really quickly, since these rocks are tracking you. It can be a little tricky. And uh, I'm playing this all wrong, actually. You should spend more time trying to clear out the, uh, the traps uh -huh. on the bottom screen. But I don't know, for some reason I just always try to press the attack. But I keep forgetting that, you know, this guy has a lot of health and you can't chip away at it very fast. So maintaining your own health is very important here. This is basically a battle of attrition in this fight. The last one I was able to engage in a damage race, but this guy you have to be a little more careful. Also, the fan is probably a better choice here. Yeah. I eventually figured that out. <laughs> One thing that people mentioned when I was first looking into getting this game was that it's a game where you learn the different weapons that are best for bosses. And I didn't appreciate that so much playing through normal mode, but playing through hard mode I definitely got it a lot more. That oh, in yeah. this game, if you use the right weapon, bosses go from impossible to, you know, moderate in terms of difficulty. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Having a rough time here. Yeah. However, I do have him pretty low down. If I can, you know, keep ahead of these rocks, there we go. Yeah. I get a heart. I, w I was gonna say you were doing a pretty good job against him. But guess what happens to my heart? Aww. Heartbroken. Heart lost. But... Yeah, yeah, I know what you. Mean. It really should carry over. 
Yeah, oh. it's an odd choice that they made to, um, have the guy spill a bunch of coins out and then, like, r get rid of the floor. Depending on where you kill him, uh, you might lose it. I now remember we actually talked about that in the first episode of Shovel Knight, when you beat the dragon boss, and sometimes your gems can just spill right over the side. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I'm so close to being able to power up the wide beam. And in fact, I really want to do that, because the boss in this level is really weak to it. Not necessarily because of, like, type weaknesses, but more just because it's huge. And so if you have the spread shot, you will, like, literally hit it with every single shot. So you do, like, four times as much damage. So I'm gonna go ahead and power that up now and get the quad. <laughs> Which reminds me of a Steve Martin joke about stereo equipment. So I got rid of the duophonic and got the quad. <laughs> have you ever heard him talk about stereos? It's hilarious. No, I have not. It's like he buys like $8,000 worth of stereo equipment and afterwards he's listening to it and he's like, this sounds like shit. I haven't heard a lot of Steve Martin's routines. Yeah, they're funny stuff. Although he I is like really cynical and kind of mean-spirited. Well... I've seen him in movies, mostly. Mm-hmm. Well, the character he plays in a lot of his movies is a lot like his stand-up routine, and a lot like his real personality, to be honest. Mm. Just kind of a dick. <laughs> his character in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, I would say, is very close to real life. I don't know if you've seen that. Yes, I have. With you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 Why do you expect me to have a memory, Greg? You know better. <laughs> What's his name? Funny. I keep forgetting his name. It's, um, Neil... Can't remember. Maybe someone in the comments will remind me. It, I, th I find it funny, um... As long as we're wishing, that... maybe someone will actually comment on the video. I think that movie got an R rating literally just for one scene. It deserved it. I mean, that scene. Yeah. Oh, crap. The funny thing is it's so gratuitous, you know? I mean, like, in a movie where they don't cuss that often, they just decide in one scene he's gonna go completely off the rails. I guess, yeah. I mean, I kind of get it, but at the same time, I don't. It's funny. When I was younger, I thought that John Hughes movies were just, like, heartwarming. Like, that was his style. But then I realized when I watched National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation that his style's actually a lot more, like, kind of edgy and, like... Yeah. Mean. Well, yeah. Which is weird, because what everyone praises him for is, like, he understands teams so well. And it's like, he also tells lots of, like, really foul jokes. Well, I mean... Well, yeah, I, I understand what you mean. That was a stupid move. That kind of was a stupid move there. Uh, yeah, Although you can buy hearts for... Well, there you go. You can buy hearts for just a few coins, which is nice. It's one of the things I really like about this game. In general, I would say this, this game's mechanics are designed to not be punishing, which is so rare, like challenging but not punishing. I wish that concept was more common. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it's not that hard to do, actually. I mean, you know, Daisuke Amaya isn't some kind of Mozart-level genius. He's just a really thorough and thoughtful game designer. So you're kind of grinding here, I'm guessing? Yeah, unfortunately. Just trying to distract by talking about John Hughes movies. I don't. But at least it's over. <laughs> anyway, because of the increased cost of stuff, you might have noticed, the cost of heart upgrades is going up really quickly. Mm -hmm. Which is tough, because you need a lot of hearts to get past some of these bosses. I would almost say that in hard mode, it's better to emphasize getting heart upgrades first rather than gun upgrades. Hmm. I don't know, it's difficult to say. In a lot of cases, you can get two at the same time. Later on is when you start having to make the really tough choices. But generally speaking, in most cases, you can get by with one fully upgraded weapon, and then just focus on hard upgrades. Mm -hmm. But choose wisely. Yeah, uh, in the... Ooh, that was rough. In the uh, original playthrough, I think the 1-up was underwater. Now you have to actually climb on the platforms to get it. Which is interesting, because in the original game, there was like no incentive to take the platforms at all. Maybe it was a little quicker? I don't know. This one, you know, makes it make a little more sense. I thought for a minute there might be a little secret cavern there, because the texture of the wall looked a little bit different. But I was letting my Metroid experience run away with me. This is not Metroid. It's a lot more of a focused experience. So yeah, the quad shot's really coming in handy here, helping me get rid of these bats. Or foxes, if you remember our first play. Were you gonna say something? 
No, I was just moving around in my chair. Okay. Here's an interesting room. This, uh, this is a total departure from the style of the original, uh, playthrough. This yeah. is a really tall, vertical room with bottomless pits. This is much more like Cave Story, uh, and also a little bit like the demo games Pink Hour and Pink Heaven, than it is like the original playthrough. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's... It's not quite Leap of Faith gameplay, because you can see where you're going. You can see the stuff, yeah. Oh, but there are several occasions where you will have to sort of get into a groove and just, like, take jumps as you see them without mm. thinking too much about it. You can easily get stuck in, like, a, a loop of uncertainty if you're not careful in this game. Case in point, this. You really need to make some clever jumps here. That was a bad move. So I get squashed here. Squish. Appropriately, in real life, this is something that happens to frogs a lot. Anyway, generally you need to jump over that pile, and you need to make sure you're firing your gun the whole time here. And uh, you also need to not do that. There's two things you can do. You can jump onto that little green platform, which is actually a trickier jump than it looks, uh, and then jump over the thing, or you can go all the way to the ladder and climb up. Which yeah. is safer, but if you've um, missed a jump back there, I don't think it's possible. Yep. So one interesting thing about this room, there's some holes that you might not notice at first. So to the right of that chest, there's oh, a hole yeah. that you can fall down. Any place where there's, um, I mean, you can see them. I don't really need to explain it. But any place where there's gaps is a, mm -hmm. is a hole. But there's also some treasure to be gotten here, so don't pass it up. Always get treasure. So yeah, now we're moving past, and I think, yeah, here we are in the boss arena. So, this boss was kind of a wake-up call in the original playthrough. It could be pretty challenging. Here, much harder. Unless you have the right weapon. Yeah. Oh, and also, depending on where you are, it can just hit you right off the bat. And I'm playing very badly here. So, in addition... Oh, Jesus. Ooh, I'm so yeah. ashamed. In addition to moving faster now, and shooting out more uh, electrical things, this boss now, instead of summoning regular fish, will summon the helicopter fish, which continue oh, to be a danger after they've uh, left the water. So that's something to consider. Remember not to get caught up this guy's tail, because he will damage you if you're right under him. However, uh, the thing about this guy is that even though he is much harder now, he's still a huge target, and I have a weapon that shoots out four projectiles at once. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Almost that, embarrassingly that easy if you get him really into that loop. Is. Mm -hmm. really I'm not sorry for what I did, because if I had not upgraded the weapon and tried to use something else, it would have been an awful battle, I guarantee oh, yeah. you. I have tried to play this guy without the quad, and it's god-awful. Worse, probably, than the final boss in the original game, though not worse than some of the bosses we're going to see soon. <laughs> but yeah, we're finally through it. Thank goodness. Going to destroy all this work. There's more and more of it every time. There we go. And before we go, we are going to see one last little vignette. <laughs> we're actually going to see more from the boss's memories. So before, they had the problem of not having enough work, and now they have too much. That's kind yeah. of interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, nothing seems to have changed in terms of the economy. But, oh, what's this? Oh, the machine oh. that generates work. Maybe this company bought one. <laughs> no, it, I think that's what happened, actually. So, yeah, the boss is like, yes, I know you're working like 10 hours a day, but you have to because we should be happy. <laughs> you may have noticed the little uh, thing in the background has gone up. Now, instead of a chart showing a decrease, it's, like, going way up. And they had to tack on a new piece of paper to show how much their volume of business is going up. Hmm. So these little uh, black guys with the green eyes, they um, will be showing up in our regular playthrough very soon. They're related to this salesman and his work-producing machine, which uh, appears to also be a super-fighting robot. Anyway, back to the present. I'm guessing he's going to be a boss fight at some point. We'll see. So yeah, but that's all in the past. Could never happen again. <laughs> no one would be so stupid as to make one of those things again. Let's just enjoy our time in this traditional Japanese inn, or ryokan. Hmm. With a hot spring, and some TV, and later they're gonna get some drinks, actually. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm remembering, um... 
The hot spring, hot springs um, in Neo, those are actually a thing. And they... I love, I love this line. I hardly ever watch TV with my boss at a travel in. <laughs> it's like, yeah, obviously. Oh, that's weird. The conundrum of never-ending overtime and the dark shadow that spreads despair. Hmm. This is what's on the TV program, but it's also reality. Anyway, we will be seeing you all next time. Thanks for watching. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.